Uh, Tom, thank you for joining us. So, uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, from an Indigenous perspective, where are we with these talks? Well, we're at a very, very serious junction right now. Uh, throughout the time that I've been participating in these United Nations talks since 1999, uh, we've come together as Indigenous Peoples United uh, from every region of the world, lifting up that there has to be a human rights approach uh, to the negotiations, that the rights of Indigenous Peoples have to be recognized and implemented within all the outcomes of these negotiations, and that uh, it's a serious matter with Indigenous Peoples, especially when, when we take into consideration our Indigenous Peoples of the Arctic, the polar regions where the sea ice is melting a lot faster than what the climate, climate scientists were predicting. And we're experiencing also the devastation of El Nino, El Nino effects and, and throughout the Americas, and as well as our brothers and sisters from the small island states. But for those of us that are here in Africa, we're seeing that the situation with the science and the predictions of Africa itself as a continent is very serious indeed, that uh, what we need to come out of this uh, COP17 is a commitment from the countries, and especially the industrialized countries of the North, the Annex I countries, to make an agreement collectively to save Mother Earth and to stop this escalation of climate change and global warming by agreeing to a second uh, commitment of the Kyoto Protocol. But we're not hearing that, we're not seeing that. We're hearing countries like Canada, which is just right north of where I live in the United States, pulling out, or at least a, uh, Canada has, in, has said that they're, they're, making a, uh, they're going to be making a decision whether they're going to stay committed to the Kyoto Protocol. So this is a serious matter to us, and definitely, because with our people, we're the most vulnerable. We're living out there in, uh, in, in, uh, along with nature, and uh, you know, it's a life and death with our people. Uh, and we don't want to see any, uh, more, any more devastation. We have indigenous people in Alaska where they have to consider relocation because the permafrost, the ground is melting. There's more uh, uh, ice melt, there's more sea erosion along the coastline, and we're losing uh, whole villages. And um, also where I live, where I come from in Minnesota, you know, we're witnessing the change in climate, the unpredictability of weather patterns. And if we're seeing it there in the Great Lakes region, the forested region of Minnesota, uh, it's sure happening all over. And people are worried about water, access to water, depletion of water. There's less recharge of groundwater. Uh, the glaciers are, are, are melting. There's less uh, water in the rivers not only in the north, but in the south, and especially here in Africa. And do you think that this process engages with indigenous people appropriately? Is your voice heard here? Well, we're, we're beginning to, to have a presence, and, uh, but there needs to be a commitment to, to incorporate uh, uh, the full recognition and we're asking that, uh, what we're asking is through the observance of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Woven into that is the principle of free, prior, and informed consent. Very critical uh, uh, issues to our people because when we're talking about mitigation and adaptation, when we're talking about funding mechanisms, we're talking about any solutions, there has to be the full participation of indigenous peoples. If we have 360 million indigenous peoples throughout the world, and that's the United Nations figure, you know, we only have one-tenth of uh, less than one percent, you know, participating. We need more uh, more uh, commitment for participation of indigenous peoples in these proceedings. And, but we are here, we're, we're standing strong, we're standing united, uh, we're acting very strategic in our interventions, we're networking, reaching out to, to governments whistling, willing to listen to us, we're meeting some of the private sector here that are also recognizing that they have to take action and do something to help uh, halt this escalating uh, uh, climate change that is happening, you know. Is there a political will happening in here to make a commitment to, to stop global warming? 
you know, I, I don't see that collective political will here as far as taking real action. But I think that the, the governments are, are starting to, to pay attention to what's happening throughout the world in their, in their countries. Tomorrow is going to be the global day of action by civil society outside the building here. And uh, I understand that there's a mobilization of 20 to 30,000 people from throughout Africa mobilizing, coming here to Durban to say that they want real, real solutions, not false solutions. And so I hope that the, the governments uh, that represent these people are listening. We, we witnessed that in Cancun when there was also a gathering of civil society that marched in the street. And uh, our, our network, the Indigenous Environmental Network, and our analysis is that, you know, we, we feel that there, there needs to be a deeper analysis of, of some of the causes of climate change. And uh, we think that there's a relationship to an economic system of the world that is not sustainable. Uh, we need to have a moratorium against any new fossil fuel development. It's that serious. The bathtub of carbon is overflowing in the atmosphere. We need to slow it down a lot faster than what uh, we're seeing uh, the, from, from the commitments that we're seeing here. Uh, we need another round of Kyoto. Uh, sure, uh, the Kyoto does have some contradictions and uh, it provided the mechanisms for clean development me uh, mechanisms, but, uh, but and there's human rights violations with, with that, I'm, uh, I understand. Uh, but those have to be addressed as well. But we, we're standing here at least for, uh, uh, for the need to, 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 to take some action here. We, you know. And, and you discussed false solutions there and, and then the possibility of real solutions coming from uh, outside of the conference. What would you see as a real solution to climate change? What are the big changes you're calling for? Well, coming from the uh, United States, you know, we, we've been advocating with other citizens uh, um, and that we need to really look at our addiction to energy in the belly of the beast of development, of industrialization, of economic globalization globalization that comes from the United States, that we have to really take action for those of us that are living there uh, and to cut our, our consumption uh, and address our consumerism attitudes. Uh, as indigenous peoples, we've always been advocates of that, that we need to respect the rights of Mother Earth. We need to develop a new consciousness that looks at Mother Earth as part of a uh, uh, a religious, a spiritual entity, so there's aspects of our cultural relationship on a deep prof spiritual profound level with Mother Earth that's really important and that's something that the indigenous peoples have also provided here is that we have to look at uh, an economic system that is sustainable that is not exploitive to the, to the relationship that we have with Mother Earth. She can only uh, uh, provide so many resources we're depleting the, the conventional oil. Now we're, we're, we see that uh, uh, governments of the world and industries going after the unconventional oil. But that's taken them into certain areas where our people live. For an example, the tar sands in northern Alberta, Canada, uh, where they devastated uh, uh, the ecosystem by clearing away the boreal forest to mine uh, this sludge type of oil called tar sands and uh, process it uh, with chemicals and great volumes of water creating toxic uh, sludge ponds and and, uh, and where does that oil go? It's going from Canada to the United States uh, to meet the energy uh, needs of the United States uh, and that's not sustainable and it's being done at the expense of the human rights of uh, our Aboriginal Indigenous peoples of Canada. Uh, but there's a relationship to, uh, to the mitigation plans here in, in these uh, United Nations negotiations because some of those corporations and governments of the North are utilizing uh, forest carbon offsets mitigation plans such as the reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation called RED. Uh, RED is a mechanism for those polluters of the North to continue to expand uh, production, uh, create, creating toxic hot spots in our communities of the north and uh, using their money to uh, investing in the uh, cheaper carbon credits of the south. 
And sure, we stand united with our indigenous brothers and forest dependent communities of the South who are trying to find solutions to the um, to the illegal logging and the deforestation of their homeland. But, uh, you know, we are all very concerned about how carbon trading, carbon offsets, the carbon market is uh, being used as a mechanism uh, to create funding, uh, to pay governments to protect their trees. But should it be done at the expense of the human rights and the health and the, and the children's health of our communities in the north? Uh, where there, these industries are, are offsetting the carbon, but they're uh, also greenwashing and trying to appear they're, they're doing good, but at the expense again of our people of the North. I think these are things that we need to, to have uh, deep analysis and dialogue and discussions uh, with the governments here and the industry, and we haven't seen that happen. Uh, we believe that this is a climate justice issue, it's a human rights issue. You know, we're looking at uh, uh, a lot of the mitigation plans that are looking at different technologies uh, to, 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 to resolve climate change, clouding the, uh, you know, seeding the clouds. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think those are things we're concerned about. Uh, uh, as indigenous peoples, we have a long-standing relationship uh, with Mother Earth. Uh, we have certain values that, uh, that provide a foundation in our decision making um, to where we has, there has to be safety protocols established for introduction of any new technologies uh, to address climate change. Uh, um, so, you know, we have been part of uh, the campaign uh, that, has, that had come out of Cochabamba. Uh, in 2009 with the Cuchabamba Accords and the Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. We feel that those are alternatives that we need to really uh, uh, support real solutions um, that, uh, are, that would help industrialized countries and, and, and economies in transition to move away from a fossil fuel economy to a sustainable and healthy economy that, uh, uh, that creates uh, a future for all of our people. Yeah, within the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is a, a global indigenous uh, organization that reflects a, a balance of our traditional indigenous knowledge, as well as our indigenous peoples who have gotten educated in, this, in the sciences of who have gotten educated in Western science. And so we're a balance. And so we are looking at real solutions, uh, not false solutions. We're looking at uh, creating dialogue on systemic change rather than climate change. We're looking at transition away from a fossil fuel economy to a sustainable economy. When I say these things, I'm saying the world needs to look at these. Um, as indigenous peoples, we're asking the world leaders and the governments they're from and all the civil society and the business sector to reevaluate what their relationship is to the sacredness of our Mother Earth, their Mother Earth. We all have one Earth, and that's our Mother Earth, and we need to be more respectful of what that relationship is. Uh, as indigenous people from, uh, from the North, uh, you know, we're looking at real solutions of uh, clean, renewable energy. We have the technology throughout the world. If, uh, if man can send people to other planets, you know, we should be able to have the intellect as man, as people of the world, as scientists of the world here, to develop uh, the technologies to make a transition quickly. Now this is an urgent matter. We need to do this sooner than later to make a transition away from using fossil fuels, away from the combustion of fossil fuels to clean renewable energy, wind, you know, even uh, 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 the oceans, utilizing the oceans. Uh, we're using solar up north. Uh, there's the technology that is there, but most important is that we, we have to really look at our energy needs. Is that sustainable? Uh, and that's tied again to economic systems. It's, can tie, it's tied to consumerism and uh, it's tied to that big C word that I've always uh, told that I shouldn't talk about and that's capitalism. 
If capitalism is not sustainable, then what is an economic system that is sustainable for our world? And that's something that we need to have dialogue on. That's not happening here, but that's going on on the outside in a lot of the civil society parallel events. And if shifting a culture of consumerism and, and, and adjusting the structure of capitalism is, is, is the goal, what do you expect to come from the UN climate talks here? What, what are you at this event? What do you want to come out the end of the week? Well, this COP17, we're hoping that, uh, that the world leaders would be able to make uh, some sort of a commitment for a, a, uh, a new legally binding agreement of cutting uh, these, these toxic admissions. Uh, and halting as drastically as we can, as fast as we can, the concentration of greenhouse gases. We need that commitment. We need the United States, we need Canada, we need the European Union, Japan, all the Annex I countries uh, to put their differences aside and, and sign on to the second commitment of the Kyoto Protocol. And, and having attended these talks for, for over a decade now, are you optimistic? Uh, being here at, at the talks and reading the, the media and uh, hearing the debates in the, in the plenaries, it's very difficult to be optimistic that there's going to be uh, some real action coming out of the COP17. But that's why we need more people from civil society in these hallways holding the governmental official accountable here. A lot of the governments are not accountable to the people. They don't make reports when they go back home. A lot of the debates are very technical. Uh, and so, you know, we see that there's a need for more transparency. We question the areas of governance and implementation, but governance around how civil society is locked out of these dialogues. And a lot of the contact groups, they don't want NGOs, observer groups, and those contact groups where they're really debating and uh, negotiating the terminology for the outcomes. This is, this is where we need the, the, the public, we need the civil society in these contact groups. Uh, so uh, we're here again as indigenous people just to, to uh, lend what, what we can to, to you know, to submit uh, some of the solutions that we have. Uh, and it's very important, very important that we, we are here. Tom, thank you very much for speaking to us.